Vasa Micic has a career night to help the Charlotte Hornets beat the Memphis Grizzlies. Plus, we ask the question, what is exactly Steve Clifford coaching for? We'll get to it all today. Locked on Hornets. We're locked on Hornets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. We live. We It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. As always, we're free and available anywhere you get your podcasts, and that includes YouTube. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars there's doug branson you can find him on the Substack, every hornets box score.com i'm walker mail listen to me on wfnz every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m 92 7 fm i'll be talking about a hornets win doug will be writing maybe already had written about a hornets win so what they were able to do against the grizzlies how about hornets getting that dub 110 to 98 much needed especially after a third loss on the season to the Detroit Pistons, especially after a loss not too long ago to Washington just last week. This was a team they should have beaten with what was an extensive injury report. But we all know this is when the Hornets are at their best. And by that, I mean they're very worst with their ability to lose to the worst teams in the NBA. Meechich didn't let it happen, though, Doug. Career night for him. Career high in points, scoring 25. He was 9 of 10 from the field, which is a career high in efficiency with more than just a couple of field goals taken in a game. Career high in three-pointers made, going 5 of 6. The career high in field goal attempts was 7 set against Golden State. So he almost even reached the career high that he made with the field goal attempts too. So Vasimicic offensively getting to the rack, what he does best, in line also with some three-point ability, which he hasn't shown on nearly a consistent level. Michich, incredible man. Balkan Bros, as you mentioned, he's one of them, and he was great last night. Balkan Bros, Balkan Bees, Poku looked good too. Um, it was it was all going for for Michich in particular. Uh, Michich, Uchich, we all chitch. Uh, he made all the threes. That's what you want to see from Michich, honestly. That's what you want to see from all of these guys as they brought in from the Thunder and the, the Mavs, them playing at a higher level than they had a chance to at their previous location. And for Michich, I, I think – this is the version of Micic that he believes he is and, and wants to become and wants to be on an every night basis. And, and I'm not sure that he's going to have that, that chance to showcase that if he remains with the team next season and they, and they don't move on from him. Uh, then, you know, is he going to get that opportunity to get these kind of minutes? I'm not so sure. But look, there's an audition process happening right now for a major sixth man role on a fully healthy Hornet squad. And that audition is happening between Michich and Mann. And when we get to the offseason, you can throw Nick Smith Jr. into that conversation as well, having one, one year of experience under his belt. And so that's what this whole final part of the season really is about. These guys getting an opportunity. Grant Williams, you can definitely put his name in that hat as well. Who's going to be the primary ball handler scorer? Who is the offense going to run through in that second unit? That's really, without LaMelo Ball, without Mark Williams, without some of these pieces, we can't really sit here and analyze what the Charlotte Hornets are going to become because we just don't have a, a full enough understanding of what they are right now. But, you know, these kind of performances tell you just individual players and roles what they could be next season. And if Meechich continues to play like this, well, I'll say if Meechich continues to play exactly like this, he's in danger of the Hornets flipping him for more assets. Uh, but he's certainly I, I thought about that, too. I thought, yeah, like it's we have a good backup point guard and now we're trying to trade him. I thought, stop it, Walker. Stop thinking that because this is someone that is going to help you. But you're right. We are a little bit in asset collection mode. And once the team does get fully healthy, then that that this is what you're supposed to think about your team. Right. But with the Hornets, it's been so long since they've had backup depth or depth at the backcourt spot excuse me so right. with Michich and man it's a good problem and yet I'm trying to get rid of them and I stopped myself short of, of actually pulling the trigger on a hypothetical trade and going to the trade machine but you're right Trey man Michich that's going to be fun to see how 
those two battle it out once they get back to next year. And Jeff Peterson has this small sample size of evaluation yeah. on both of them. It will be fascinating to watch. We're going to ask what Steve Clifford's coaching for. We know what those guys are playing for. I've got some explanations as to why you're thinking that way because I don't think you're the only one. Well, certainly you're not because I had the same thought, but I think other other people that are listening to this right now had the same thought too. And, and I think there's two reasons behind that. One is that for some of these guys, we haven't had an opportunity to really fall in love with them and get attached to them because they've only been around since since February, since the trade deadline. So, you know, it's not like Brandon Miller or Miles Bridges where, where these fandoms develop around particular players. So that's reason number one. But reason number two, I think this is the primary reason, is that we've, we've almost been conditioned as fans not to appreciate what a really good backup point guard can do for your team because this team uh, has, has really uh, denied us good backup point guard play because every time LaMelo Ball gets healthy – the team goes, well, forget about it. Forget about backup point guard. We'll just go out and find Dennis Smith Jr. on the last legs of his career, or we'll find Ish Smith and, Emmanuel, uh, and uh, Edmund Sumner and, uh, you know, Frank Nielakina. You know, all of these $5 Walmart DVD bin, you know, backup point guard options, That that's what they've conditioned us to believe is the backup point guard position for this team. But you and I know, Walker – that if you're going to be serious about the playoffs, if you're going to be serious about a run, you've got to have not one, not two, but multiple guys that can handle the ball, shoot three, score, and uh, and pass. And that's what Michich represents for the Hornets. And so while, yes, I, I think I've been conditioned to go for the trade, I hope they do hold on to him. And I hope Michich, you know, reaches – I said earlier, this is what Michich thinks he can be. I hope Michich actually becomes this. Yeah, we are a product of our environment. We have been cup checked. That's what we have been wanting to trade some of the backcourt depth that we have now. Let me ask you this before we move on. Trey Mann or Vasa Micic, who's more valuable to this team now? It, and has that changed at all? Has that been a roller coaster as we've seen both of these guys on the roster? I, I think that it's Micic right now because uh, Micic is... I think has the higher ceiling in terms of a full offensive impact. You know, 25 points, yes, Mitch's career high, but but the eight assists. You know, I mean, he was he was absolutely dealing, and his ability to move a defense and limit his turnovers has has been a wonder for this team. I mean, they don't win this game. The, Memphis in that third quarter. They were creeping up on the Hornets, and they were threatening to do to the Hornets what the Detroit Pistons and Washington Wizards had done to them before, which is which is just just beat them through hustle and physicality. And it was Mijic who saved them in this game, and Bridges, Miles Bridges' hustle really helped them as well. We can talk more about that in the in the next segment. Yeah, Bridges was good, but Man mm -hmm. did not have a good game. I mean, in, in his return off the injury list. He didn't have a really good game because he was turning the basketball over, making bad decisions with the ball in his hand, uh, and and not hitting you know not hitting enough shots to to really counter that. And defensively, Scottie Pippen Jr. was all over Trey Mann, like it was just no contest beating him with speed, time in and time out. He did it a little bit to Mijic, but I think you know Mijic's ability to drive and finish at the rim is is a serious threat. And if you compare that with a three point shot, it, it's definitely Mijic over Mann at this point. Yeah, well, especially after the injury, but also if you look at Micic, he just continues to get to double digit scoring outputs. Like he's averaging 15 points per game in the month of March. He's 15 points per game after last night, which is doing a lot of the heavy lifting from the outside, but he's shooting 38% from three and 49% from the field. Again, a lot of that has to do with what happened against Memphis. And so those numbers are inflated, but even still scoring 15 isn't really crazy inflated after the 25 point output you know it's not like he went off for 40 and that's doing all the work so what Michich is doing right now and you're right man getting to the rim it he's not getting there with explosiveness and he's not getting there just because you can't stay in front of him like that but he's good at getting you up in the air and then just finding the different angles to get there whenever he wants to or a lot of the times right yeah, yeah I think it is Michich right now but it's a good problem to have. I don't even know if it's a problem. It, Trey Mann, Michich, it, both have been a, a nice addition to this team. And, and, and Michich's development will be 
because right now he's a high, high, low, low player, right? I mean, when he's when he's up like this, there's no complaints. But there's not totally a middle ground with him. There's either this or there's, oh, man, he just missed like seven straight three-pointers in a row, and you've got people – And turned it over five times this game. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and so can he get to a middle ground? What could help him do that? Well, I mean, you know, a decent floater game, you know, some game that sits in the middle between him driving and beating his guy completely or pulling up for three – you know, is there are there some things that he can add to his offensive bag that can help him over the course of a game pull out of a tailspin of a shooting night? You know, that's that's what he's got to develop. Yeah, man, the the frequency and the accuracy at the rim is fantastic for him. You'd love to see it. Let's move on. Let's get to some more uh, details from this game coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Let's get to the night that Miles Bridges had and then tell you what else we noticed against the Grizzlies. Plus, Steve Clifford, what is he coaching for? We'll get to all of it in just a moment on Locked on Hornets. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your get or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. This episode is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because it's just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections. Then you can watch the winnings roll on in. Plus, it's demon time on prize picks. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks, and you can turn $10 into $1,000. Demons and goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play at prize picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins get you different payouts. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. More locked on Hornets ahead. All right, Doug, what else did you notice from last night that you thought was interesting or uh, impressive? Maybe something you had a problem with outside of watching Michich have such a nice performance. One of the best Miles Bridges games I think I've seen, uh, certainly um, in in a while. I don't know if I go as far as to say this season, uh, but uh, certainly I think he's been struggling a bit with the current role that he has on the team, which is like do, do it all, primary score, ball handler, offensive initiator, you know, decision maker. I think Michich having a great game probably has something to do with that because he didn't have to do as much of that. But 27 points, six rebounds, and six assists. And I wrote this in every Hornets box score. His just general hustle and movement around the court and and six rebounds, yes, but some of those rebounds were tough rebounds in traffic where he didn't have to get that rebound. And if he had tried a little less, he wouldn't have gotten the rebound. One of those situations where you can kind of fake like you're going to get the rebound and not get it, he was going 100% for some of these boards because he understood how important it was to get a victory against a team in Memphis that really was, if we're being honest about it, trying to give them the victory. Like it it was the injuries. Yes. But it's also, this was a, a definitely a game between two teams that have played a lot of different lineups. Like there was no rhythm there was no flow. There were a lot of passes that went nowhere, a lot of offense that didn't make a lot of sense from both teams. But Charlotte did possess the, the, the most experience and the most talent on the floor. Miles Bridges represented that 
and he played like it, and 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 I love to see it. Yeah, you mean 41 combined turnovers isn't good? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> well, not only that, the Hornets, they, they, yeah, they turned it over 20 times. They were beat on the offensive board. 16 offensive rebounds allowed for uh, some number of, I think, 17 second chance points. Uh, this and, and what's funny is that before the game, and, and Ashley, <laughs> uh, shout out to Ashley Shahamadi, who actually brought this up to Clifford postgame, but pregame, Clifford said, key to the game turnovers limit turnovers and and defensive rebounding (laughs) well they got pounded in turnovers they got pounded on the boards and they won and they won because they were playing the Memphis Grizzlies who turned it over more and shot horribly at the rim because they actually shot well from three and G.G. Jackson uh, was a big part of that but uh, they they just couldn't hit anything at the rim they couldn't hit anything inside the arc and so, yeah, you get the win there. But I thought, really, like, Miles' hustle jumped off the screen to me in a way that I haven't seen in in at least a, a couple of weeks. Well, and, and just, you know, you talk about just hitting shots, too. That'll help. I mean, he was 12 of 21 and 3 of 7. You totally healthy shot diet there for Miles Bridges. And you certainly like to see him go for 27 points. Michich is the story because it's the career high in a bunch of different categories for him. He quite literally has never done this before. Right. It was nice to see Miles Bridges get to what he was able to do. Speaking of the turnovers, so Michich, high turnover guy usually, only two last night, contributing to the 20 that they had. You would, I would just automatically think Michich probably had more than two if the whole team had 20. Not the case, though. Grant Williams had six. And Grant Williams, and look, Grant Williams has been finishing extremely well inside the three-point arc. It's very reminiscent, Doug. If you start to look at Grant Williams' numbers this year compared to the best season that he had in the NBA, which was two years ago in Boston, or th- yeah, three years ago, right? Or whatever. The best year in Boston. It's very similar in the fact that he's not taking a bunch of shots in the restricted area, but he's hitting at an elite clip. So when he does take them, he is as good as anybody down there close to the basket. The three game, that's actually like average at this point. It's starting to even out a little bit compared to the rest of the NBA. A couple of years ago, he was much better from distance. The thing that is going to drive us crazy, and I think we got a taste of this right at the very beginning of his tenure here with the Hornets, the turnovers are pretty ridiculous for somebody that isn't. He, his usage percentage is pretty high, but Grant Williams is turning the ball over at a ridiculous rate. Like he's one of the worst ball taker carers of in the NBA. <laughs> so, six turnovers last night. He's had 11 in the last two games. There's just so many times where he passes it to no one or he's not on the right page with somebody, which I guess some of this could be chemistry, but that like, one of four from three, the 18 points are great. The fact that he's getting to the foul line, that that's great. That balances out. But you talk about some bad games that you could get, especially if Grant doesn't rebound. Yeah, man, Grant is also in that Michich area where a low could be a real low and that he just hands over the game. And that's frustrating to watch. Like six turnovers from your big, your stretch big, that can't happen because going small, that's part of the reason as to why you go small is because you have somebody that you feel comfortable taking care of the basketball, and that just isn't happening, but still was able to balance it out. With all the turnover talk, able to balance it out and give you 18 points and six boards, fine, <clears throat> off of the bench. I'll take that from Grant any day. And so, yeah, interesting. Like, not polarizing. I wouldn't say that. Like, we know what his role is, but interesting different types of dynamics with his game when you watch him. Yeah, it it can't be six. It it really it shouldn't be five. But you're probably no. going to have to be okay with with three. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it, yes, no, okay, yeah, right. And that's be- not great, right? But you're you're totally right about that. It's not great, but if he can, but but he a lot of his turnovers are trying to make plays, and so it's it's really to me it's about how many plays do you want him to make? Can we maybe make him make a a, a few less plays? And then there are going to be some assists and there are going to be some turnovers. A lot of these turnovers are him trying to thread a needle on, on a pass, you know, to a cutting big uh, or, or a cutting guard. You know, so, like, he's trying to make plays and it's just not happening. Will, will time heal some of that? Will chemistry heal some of that? You hope so. Health, it, healthy roster. You're right. Like, it, once they get guys back, Grant's going to be affected too, so that's totally fair. Totally, and I'll give you another thing. I think Grant is mostly effective passing out of the post-up position, 
when they run a play for him and clear out the side and get him in a post-up position and he's throwing it cross court to the guy in the opposite corner or when a, a Nick Richards there was there was a particular play I saw a couple of games ago where they they got Grant ISOed uh, in a post up position and then Nick went to set a screen for somebody else slipped that screen and cut to the rim and Grant delivered a, a perfect uh, pass he's a good passer it's just I think he's trying to just sort of do a little too much sometimes overplay a little bit with his passing ability and that's what gets him into some of this turnover trouble and so yeah I think as a fan and continuing to watch Grant if he's a long term piece for this team. You don't want six, you don't want to praise five, but you're probably going to have to be okay with two to three turnovers a game from him. By the way, in in a role that is suitable for him with a healthy roster, would love for him to be a part of this team long term. Like what I would I would like that. I would sign off on that. Just there are some problems every now and then. Real quickly, any any quick Brandon Miller thoughts, just because we haven't mentioned him. You know, not not the greatest night from Brandon, shooting wise, and four of twelve from Brandon, two of six from three. Um, did have five assists and four steals, four which steals. is a lot. For, so, yeah, so just any other things that you notice from Brandon's game? You know, I thought he um, he got them going, especially early fourth. Like, he, he definitely looked a little off early in the game, didn't shoot the ball particularly well, looked a little slow, too, at times. Um, but it was like he was – you know, Michich got going really early, nine points in the first quarter. Miles Bridges was going early, 10 points in the first quarter. And I just, I, maybe, I don't know if there was something off or if maybe he just sort of sensed like, okay, these guys are obviously on it right now. I'm gonna, just going to sort of bide my time, focus on the defensive end of the floor. I'm going to pick my spot. And he certainly picked his spot because, I mean, I, again, I thought early fourth, him getting steals and getting out into transition helped push the lead there were multiple times in this game where the Hornets were just kind of letting the Grizzlies hang around. And we've seen this multiple times this season. Oh, yeah. Letting teams hang around. And they would just start to nip away at a double-digit lead and get it down to seven or six, as close as three at one point in the third quarter. And the Hornets would have to smack it back down. And one of the final times they did that, Brandon Miller was a big part of that. And so you look at the box score line, and it's it's not great except for those four steals. But he picked his moment. And – that's to me, that's what stars do sometimes, right? Stars go, hey, other guys are going are going right now. I'm gonna hold out a little bit. I don't have to force the action. I can wait until you know the horn the, the wait until they're going to need me, which is in that third and fourth quarter. And he did it. So honestly, I thought this was a sneaky good game from Brandon Miller. I have some more thoughts. Let's get to the next segment, then talk a little bit more about Steve Clifford. Coming up next on Locked On Hornets. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Some finishing Brandon Miller thoughts and how is Steve Clifford's future affected by the way that the Hornets play the rest of this season with a long road stretch coming up and then the longest home stretch like in franchise history long. We'll get to all of that in just a moment on Locked On. This episode is brought to you by Robin Hood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA. Robin Hood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robin Hood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robin Hood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Doug, you had some finishing thoughts as well on the game last night. Uh, just got a, kind of a weird thing to point out that they did not shoot a single free throw. The Hornets did not shoot a single free throw yeah. until the fourth quarter, and then they shot a ton of them. Uh, they they didn't hit as many as you'd like, but they went 
9 of 13, but all in the fourth quarter. They didn't have a single shooting foul. And asked about it after the game, Steve Clifford, uh, Ashley Shamity said, hey, do you ever remember a game in which your team did not shoot a free throw into the fourth quarter? He said, nope. <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> he knew. He knew. If, if that game goes any uglier, that is something he takes the fine for or mentions at the podium. But, yeah, him saying no, he knew exactly that they did not take a free throw until the fourth quarter. The, the finishing thoughts that I had, just on Brandon Miller, like just some some season stuff to watch, It's it, he's still going to be a great shooter, but it, it's going to get to 36% if he continues on this, which is just interesting because he had been hovering around 39, 40, like, you know, among the best shooters in the league from distance. And he still looks like one of the best shooters in the league, especially at his ceiling. But the points per shot attempt, they're starting to go down a little bit. You start to see the three-point percentage. It, again, you're going to get the 36. Not that this matters at all to me as far as how we can project his his look. I wonder if – I think Brandon's already done too much good to fall out of favor of a certainly first-team all-rookie team. Like, that isn't happening. I don't even know about, like – third place there I don't think there's any way that he falls out of third place on the rookie of the year award voting there's still enough time in my opinion to where maybe voters would hold that against him if he continues on this kind of stretch where I I I think that there's too much good though Doug to take any like real substantial award away from him like maybe rookie of the month is on the table to lose for the month of March. I don't know if that would be the case, but yeah, just the numbers are starting to go down a little bit from distance and some of the efficiency still does not bother me. And I don't think it bothers many other people, nor should it about what his long-term outlook is. No. And I don't think that losing any of those awards really matters to Brandon Miller at all. Right. I mean, at least that's the indica all the indications that I've gotten from Brandon Miller is that he could give two hoots, about anything awards wise in his rookie year because he wants he wants the big dog awards. He wants the all NBA honors. He said that's yeah. what he's working towards. He wants rings, you know, he wants championship banners. Those are the kind of things that he dreams about. He doesn't dream about rookie of the month or, you know, first team or second team rookie or whatever. And he's certainly out of the running for rookie of the year. So n- none of that matters. You know, Steve Clifford at the end of last season warned everyone about looking too much at how particular players play and and overinflating their value based on how they played at the end of a season where there was nothing to play for. Well, I think there's also a danger to the flip side of that, of of undervaluing a player or or devaluing a a good player who's playing in, in a weird situation at the end of a season when there's nothing to play for and, and he doesn't have a good, you know, elite primary ball handler like LaMelo Ball with him night in and night out. And when he's had to take different roles all season and play with a thousand different kind of lineups, you know, there's a danger in sort of overthinking that too on the flip side of taking the good player and thinking, well, is he really that good? You know, I think we've seen enough from Brandon Miller to understand, okay, this yeah. guy has all the tools got to get bigger. He knows that by the way, and he's getting bigger. And so, yeah, there's just really nothing to be concerned about at this point with Brandon Miller. Um, the only thing you're concerned about is that, you know, he gets in his own head, that he gets frustrated, that he takes all of this losing and internalizes it. And it comes out as like, you know, I don't know, frustration and not sort of just competitive, like, all right, reset, let's go. But I, I don't, I'm not concerned about that at all. But that would be the only somewhat concern I think you could have about Brandon Miller. I'll say this too, for the position average on assist percentage, the last couple of games, I was looking at his trends. He's above the position average right now. So that's yeah. actually starting to go up. So that just kind of gives you along the lines of thinking he's contributing more. It goes to what you were talking about in the last segment too. him just letting his other guys eat. This is great experience for him. I meant to say that in the last episode we did is he's catching so much attention from the defense um, if he keeps getting better, that's not going to go away, and that's going to happen as he gets better. That's going to happen even if LaMelo Ball is completely healthy, even if Miles Bridges you know, reaches somewhere close to the all-star level and they retain him and, and everything goes well. Like Defenses are going to focus on your best player every night, and that's what Brandon Miller is projecting out to be. And so to get that experience now as a rookie, 
I mean, that's it's incredible for him. I'm, I'm happy that these defenses are attacking him, even if he's turning it over, even if he's not doing as much playmaking as I would like to see. I love him fighting through this extra defensive attention right now because it's experience and tape that he can take into the offseason and get better with. We've teased it enough. We need to address it in this episode before we move on and just need to ask, what is Steve Clifford coaching for after Jeff Peterson talked about the small sample evaluation? At least it's something that you're working with. Steve Clifford losing to Washington along with the rest of the team. It's not all on him, but losing to Washington, losing to Detroit, you needing to face a roster of Grizzlies that, whew, buddy, you got to be a hardcore NBA fan to know 80% of the roster that you watched take on the Hornets last night. That's what you needed to get this victory. Is this trending down? Speaking of trends, is this trending downward for Steve Clifford as far as his chances to get the head coaching job next year? Or has it already been decided somewhat, Doug? What can happen these last 20 games, last 15, I guess we're getting to now, and what Steve Clifford is coaching for? I don't think that it's 50-50. I think it's more than likely that he stays. And so I guess there's more to lose in this in this last little group. Like if the Hornets start to trend down defensively and they start to really let the rope go and they, you know, they've got the big home stretch, if they embarrass themselves night in and night out in front of a home crowd to end the season, then yeah, I mean, I think there's an opportunity for this new front office to evaluate that and say, you know, is this the the right guy for for this young roster, uh, youngish roster now, um, or or do we look at someone else? But also, he, you know, even in saying that, where I think it's more than likely that he comes back, I I do. There's this thing that's nagging in my head about like, look, I, I think when you bring in a new person in the front office, they're they're gonna want to make their stamp somewhere. Now, at least Jeff Peterson would have an opportunity with all these pieces that they brought in from the trade deadline. You could do a lot to reshape this roster in the offseason with the contracts being what they are. You've already signed LaMelo, so that's out of the way. You don't have to worry about doing anything with Brandon Miller's contract. You've got the big thing with Miles Bridges sitting there looming. you got a lot of flexibility in the roster, so you could reshape this thing and make that your mark. But if there's a name floating around, and look, there are a lot of names floating around that are connect- connected with – uh, Atlanta, I mean, Budenholz are being one of them. You know, I, I just think even if Clifford does everything right from here to the end of the season, there's still this thing inside my head going, man, you know, mm, I could okay. see You're Jeff Peterson. Yeah. I could see Jeff Peterson just going, yeah, you know, thanks, Clifford. Appreciate your service. Uh, you did a great job. But, you know, there's this name that I've that's connected with me that I know that I trust, that I understand, and I want to bring them in and start and start quickly. The other stamp would be the top five, seven pick that the Hornets are going to have. Yeah. So that would be the other one for Jeff. But you're right, especially if that connection with Budenholzer is strong enough with the help of Rick Schnall. Because remember, right. the, the, I, I hate doing this. Maybe it's not Jeff Peterson's stamp. Could, could Maybe be. it's alongside Rick Schnall, you know. But if that's the case, I, I would take a Budenholzer. Like you pretty clearly have to take Mike Budenholzer, who. Honestly, you can make a strong case you've never been fired by Milwaukee in the first place. But I think what you and I are trying to say here is to look at this last stretch of games and to say, well, if Clifford does X, he'll be fine. Or Clifford does Y, and he's not going to be fine. To me, that's a naive way of looking at it. Honestly, I think Clifford has proven everything that he can prove already this season. He's he's uh, coached. He's kept the team together. They haven't like gotten super frustrated or gone in front of the media. They haven't had too many you know, backdoor meetings or whatever, players only meetings. He hasn't lost the locker room. And he's actually improved a team that has no business improving defensively. He's actually gotten them to play decent defense. Like I don't know what he has left to prove. But to think that that, that was going to matter is is naive because there are so many other little factors swimming around when you change ownership and you change front office like you have. That'll do it for Locked On Hornets. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. That's Doug Branson. Find him on everyhornetsboxscore.com. All of his write-ups, all of his game analysis. And you can listen to me on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3, 92.7 FM. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow for an episode to finish out the week.